I'm Benjamin Siegel, and welcome back to this introduction to India and South Asia. We're going to pick up right where we left off last time, after the major events of 1857 prompted a total reorganization of British administration and the remaking of British ideologies. A period of time known as Company Raj had been transformed into Crown Raj. What came before wasn't innocent by any means. But Crown Raj was something harder, more designed, more deliberate in many ways, and it was much more exploitive than the regime that had come before it. 1857 had terrified the British in India. It had shaken to the core so many of the liberal assumptions that it had underwritten its first hundred years of empire. And after 1857, as British rule remade itself, the British felt that it would be necessary to draw new distinctions between populations and to rearrange the different economic arrangements that had come before. We're going to get to all of that today. When we left off last time, we were talking about these new theories of race that seemed to be percolating in the wake of the 1857 rebellion, and these began to take on new concrete form in the decades that followed. The British helped to create new distinctions through space. Ever since the beginning of British trade and then British rule in South Asia, Indians and Europeans had occupied different spaces and cities. But after 1857, the British worked to cordon off and demarcate spaces that were exclusively for their own use. In cities, new neighborhoods called civil lines were built, which were meant as safe and separate neighborhoods for British residents. The military was stationed in a separate cantonment as well. In the mountains, the British built hill stations. They were summer escapes that were meant not only for civilians, but also the colonial governments themselves. Earlier in the 19th century, it had mostly been men who had been arriving in India. But as the century progressed, there were an increased number of women and then families who were accompanying men to India. There was a growing sense among the British that families needed to be separated from the hustle and bustle of cities. In part, these distinctions were made possible by new technologies. Things like the railroads, the posts, and by the 1850s, the telegram allowed someone in a hill station to stay in ready contact with someone who was in one of India's major cities. But it was also a new, deepened belief in racial hierarchy and racial difference that helped to create these new institutions. Back in Europe, in the second half of the 19th century, there was a sense that cities were places of disorder and pollution. People in Europe at this time wouldn't have used the term environmental, but they were coming up with new theories of disease to help them explain a growing wave of epidemics. There was the idea that bad air or atmospheric particles were causing diseases. These ideas weren't exactly right, but they stoked a number of good solutions, and many of them made their way to India. In the decades after 1857, there was a new effort by administrators to build drainage canals, to take trash out of cities, to make sure that they had safe water supplies, and to disperse crowds which had built up in urban settings. The city of Allahabad is one of India's most important. This is the big pilgrimage center of India, where the Ganges and the Yamuna rivers meet and where the Kumbh Mela festival is regularly held. The British rebuilt Allahabad on a grid, they put down paved streets, and they covered the gutters and sewers, and they planted avenues of salubrious trees. Most of this, of course, was done in the European as opposed to the Indian parts of town. There was a military cantonment established that was made as a buffer between Indians and Europeans. Again, it was this idea of creating racial distinctions and mirroring that through new ideas of sanitation. Increasingly, the British were trying to get out of town and to avoid the diseases that they saw as endemic on the Indian subcontinent. They did this by escaping to hills. They went up to the Himalayas in the north and the Nilgiri Hills in the south. In 1865, there was a summer capital made for British India in the town of Shimla up in the Himalayas. Missionaries and princes also created their own hill stations in cities like Mussoorie and Kodikanai and Muri. These hills reminded the British of Britain. It was a place of rain, of mud, of tea, of hills, all things that seemed like a little bit of home. There were English cottages and country houses, gardens planted with English flowers and vegetables. There was a bandstand, a mall. Schools were established there for these families. This is another way that the British were distancing themselves from Indian society and working to order and control it. We can go back a little bit and think about that process of ordering and knowing and controlling and that transformation from knowledge to information. 
Increasingly, the British wanted mastery of the places that they controlled. In 1878, the Indian government undertook the first survey of India's lands. In 1881, three years later, they ordered a census with the idea of counting just how many people there were in India. Every 20 years, these processes would be repeated. There were new regulations in this time that stipulated that newspapers and journals had to be registered and that copies of books and pamphlets had to be sent directly to the government for review. By the 1860s, the Hindu and Muslim civil law codes, which rigidified and simplified a lot of practice, were put on the books as real fixed laws. Once again, people who were roaming around India posed a new problem. We of course remember the famous case of Thuggy and the idea that roving tribes were eventually settled. But after 1857, increasingly, a wider group of itinerant people, tribes, pastoralists, were all called criminal tribes. This was baked into that idea of martial races that was percolating in the military. This played out in gender, too. Alongside that idea of martial races was a new idea of who was masculine and who was feminine. And at this point in time, Bengalis came to be seen as a feminine race. A lot of this was the work of Victorian anthropologists who were in India at the time, studying different populations. Their work helped to promote the idea of caste as a permanent fixed identity, a concrete thing that could be put in a hierarchy, counted, quantified. This systemization of caste was also connected to the new technology of photography. This idea that you had an exact image that could be used as a perfect reproduction that gave you scientific precision. In 1868, there was a first compilation of caste books published called The Peoples of India. These were pictures that for the first time tried to convey to the British what the Indian populations looked like. In many ways, books like these were acts of fantasy or creation, but they passed for scientific knowledge. It was all part of a bigger effort to take complex places, people, and cultures and to move them into simple categories and to make India knowable to its new imperial masters. Having talked a little bit about culture and the changing ways that cities and society was reorganized and defined, we should turn our attention to the new forms of political and economic changes taking place. This period after 1857 and before the turn of the 20th century was really the high noon of the colonial system, and it's when the full force of colonial exploitation came to be known. Let's start out with this figure who's gonna help us understand what was taking place in India. Dadabai Neruji, would later become known as the grand old man of Indian nationalism. By training, he was a mathematician. He had graduated from good schools in Bombay, and he became the most important voice arguing for the rights of Indians as British subjects. Dada Banerjee was the first Indian who had been elected to the British House of Commons, and from 1892 to 1895, he was able to set out India's interests with clarity and precision, speaking to the British people in English. His work summed up the sentiments of elite educated Indians as they tried to argue that while the colonial order was okay in theory, in practice, much more needed to be done for the country's improvement. Dadabai Neruji saw a lot to admire in British rule. He liked that banditry had been eliminated, that Hindu widows were now allowed to remarry. He liked that men and women had been the subjects of education. He said that British India had peace and order, freedom of speech, liberty of the press, that Indians had higher political awareness and big aspirations. He liked that the British had given loans for railways and irrigation. And most importantly, he admired a slowly growing desire of late to treat India equitably and as a country held in trust. But he said too that there was a debit side to his argument, things that Britain had done wrong to India. The British had breached their pledge to give Indians a fair and reasonable share in the administration of their own country. He said that British officials had disregarded the feelings and views of Indians. The British had spent all their effort coming up with new ways to tax the Indians without ever considering their ability to pay. He said that the relationship between England and India remained fundamentally unfair. But most importantly, Dada Bainaraji contended that there was a drain of wealth leaving India in the form of payments up to 500 million pounds a year, which he also suggests is a strong underestimate. Not only had British officials stolen India's wealth, but the famines that were now taking place in India were signs of the disruption that had been made to the local economy. In a famous speech to the British Parliament, Dadabai Neruji says that the British system is called a sarkarkichuri, a knife of sugar, 
It's smooth and sweet, but still a knife. And he says that British rule in India has become un-British. It's worth digging a little bit into that idea of a drain of wealth. Working as an economist, Dada Bainerjee is able to see that the British claims of governing India for its own good were basically nonsense. He contended that India's economic system was characterized by a drain of wealth. Every year, Indians sent massive amounts of wealth to England. They were paying to liquidate old company shares, to pay off debt on investments that were already secure, like the railways, and to pay funds for the India office and to pay out old pensions. Dada Bainerji said that Indians were paying too much of this share, and peasants in particular were paying the bulk of it. Things also seemed to get a lot worse when you kept in mind that the value of silver, which was the standard for the rupee, was declining against the pound. It seemed to Dada Bainerji that Britain was also using this favorable balance of trade with India to meet the deficits that it had with other European nations. British officials who responded to Neraji said that the money leaving India to England was a fair price paid for the services that the British were rendering. But others agreed with Neraji. They saw Britain as taking away resources that could otherwise have been used for deep investment in India. While this drain was taking place, India had become the chief export market for British goods. British textiles, iron, steel, machinery, and many other things were being sent to India. And India sent Britain all of its raw materials, commodities like cotton, indigo, jute, rice, oil seeds, tea. Increasingly, commercial agriculture was tying India's peasants to markets and forces far away from India. In most of the theories of economic growth, both today and at the time, the idea was that people should move away from agriculture and industry. It had happened in Europe, it had happened in the United States, and it was also happening in countries like Japan. But in India, the proportion of people dependent on agriculture kept growing, and it was more than 70% by the end of the 19th century. So people's lives were really tied to developments that took place overseas. We can see this if we think about one commodity, cotton. Of course, it had been grown by enslaved Africans in the American South. But after the Civil War and the end of slavery, India became much more important as a global source of cotton. So the value of exports skyrocketed about three times between the 1850s and the 1870s. But by 1900, as other players entered the cotton space, it dropped to around a ninth of that level. And as synthetic dyes became more important, commodities like indigo became less important on the global market. Jute and tea always remained important global commodities. The first for use is ropes or in gunny sacks, and the second, of course, to drink but it was mostly British business interests that dominated these industries. The rise and importance of commercial agriculture in this period, or the production of crops mostly for sale overseas, made Indians grow fewer of the coarse but high quality grains that had been their staple foods. And it made peasants really dependent on food that had been grown elsewhere, either in India or around the world. There were places where Indians benefited. In the late 19th century in Punjab, there were large scale canal colonies built, the possibility of a steady stream of water arriving on newly cultivated soils made it possible for Punjabis to grow a lot more wheat, sugarcane, and maize. Punjab really prospered in this period. And it was helped out by the new transportation infrastructure provided by the railway. By the end of the century, India had the fifth longest railway system in the world. But it was built in a way that tended to maximize export possibilities. It went to ports. And so it really disadvantaged the transportation of goods inland. It meant that groups in India were often disconnected from export commodities. But India was also providing the British Empire with indirect economic advantages. India was the best source of indentured labor for tropical colonies in the British Empire. At the beginning, indenture had begun as a way of replacing African labor in cane fields with the abolition of slavery in British territories in the 1830s. But as British demand for sugar skyrocketed, other labor was needed and Indian villager is proved willing to accept a certain period of overseas labor against the backdrop of land fragmentation and uncertainty about the possibilities of agriculture in India. So in this period, Indians went overseas. They went as workers to Jamaica, to Trinidad, to British Guiana, to Mauritius, Fiji, Natal, and Malaya. Others went to Burma, to Ceylon, along the East African coast, to Kenya, to Zanzibar, and Uganda. In East Africa, they worked to build the railway that opened up new possessions 
At the same time, the Indian army was deployed and paid by the Indian taxpayer to protect British trade routes and imperial interests overseas. This took place in China during the Boxer Rebellion in 1890, but Indian soldiers were also used in East Africa and the Middle East. Indian traders in this period began to follow some of these networks. They found employment and opportunities in the British Empire and all around the Indian Ocean. Ismailis went to East Africa, they followed the Aga Khan. The Chediaras from Madras used their credit lines to move into British Burma and Ceylon. India at this period was essential not only for what it gave directly, but for what it did for the larger British Empire. This was also a period when the British were taking stock of Indian society in new ways. Increasingly, British administrators spoke about loyal Indians, those who would help promote the interests of the empire and who would participate in the new governing structure that had been set in place in the decades since 1857. The idea of race was always close to the surface. The most important idea that the British embraced was the idea that India had an unchanging social order made up of separate and distinct communities. And in each of these communities, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, and others, there were natural leaders who were able to speak for the interests of the group. The British came to imagine the Indian government as a court advised by native voices who would represent the interests of different populations. And in this period, groups like the princes and the landed zamindars became conservative bulwarks for British power. This was a period when there were many new colleges established. They were meant to socialize these Indians into aristocratic values. They learned everything from polo to tiger shooting. Educated Indians played a particular role in this period. At this point in time, there wasn't a very large formally educated population. By the turn of the century, it was certainly no more than 3% and mostly it was males who had been educated and not females. The resources for education in India were concentrated at the college or university level, and so there wasn't a lot of primary education. Liberal policy had really failed in the 19th century. Those who spoke English comprised less than a single percent of the population at the time. But for this group, working in government was a major goal. Indians had a lot of constraints that prevented them from participating in the modern business sector, and so government service, along with law, medicine, education, and journalism, became increasingly important avenues for English-speaking educated Indians in this period. Not many Indians were qualified to prepare or sit for the Indian civil service exam. But as those numbers grew, educated Indians increasingly became parts of the governing structure of empire. Slowly, different government opportunities grew open to Indians. At first, it was just in departments like education, sanitation, or public health, seen as not very prestigious posts. But by 1892, there were limited elections held for legislative councils. Indians were frustrated by the slow pace of reform and acceptance in government service. But things were beginning to change, and increasingly, educated Indians felt capable of articulating their own interests in the empire. In 1885, Around 70 English-educated Indians came together in Bombay to form the Indian National Congress. The Indian National Congress would emerge as the parent group for the longest-lived nationalist movement in the modern world, and it would serve as a model for lots of other independence movements elsewhere, most notably in South Africa. The founder was not Indian. He was a retired British officer, an Englishman named Alan Octavian Hume. He spent his days birdwatching but he had emerged late in his career as a supportive voice for Indian nationalist interests in the government. Members of the Indian National Congress were bound together by shared interests and common experience. They had shared formative experiences in London, in Delhi, in Calcutta, studying for the bar or the civil service, and they worked in lots of different modern industries. They had taken the railroads, they had used the postal system, and they read newspapers and professional journals in English. The Indian National Congress wasn't the first interest group of its type. There had been lots of other organizations founded around the same time that sought to represent Indian interests to the government. But it was the Indian National Congress that would prove the most influential. The Congress leadership wanted to draw Muslims into their meetings. But most Muslim leaders, like Syed Ahmed Khan, continued to think of Muslims as a different community with different interests. Amir Khan argued that Congress couldn't serve as a representative for both Hindus and Muslims. But Congress had universal aims. 
It held that caste, community, and self were all less important than the public good of the Indian nation. In the early years, the Congress didn't question the importance of continuing British rule. It had a conservative leadership base. Its members came from fields like law or journalism or teaching. Occasionally they were businessmen, landowners, or merchants. What they did want greater Indian participation in the legislative councils, a real new opportunities for Indians in the Indian civil service. They wanted less money spent on the army and more money spent on development. The early Congress operated conservatively through petitions, public addresses, and a desire to ask hard questions in the interest of preserving the British status quo. They didn't really participate in the big cultural, religious, and social reform activities that other groups were taking part in. There was really no sense in its beginning years that this would become the group that would eventually midwife Indian independence. So let's leave it here. In the years after 1857, the British doubled down on the process of separating themselves from Indian society. This was evident in new modes of planning, new ideas about race and sanitation, and new ways of organizing the economy and making use of Indian labor in India and around the world. This became a period that was the high noon of colonial rule, where we see a really classical imperial economy emerging. But at the same time, the new ideas that the British had about who could represent Indian populations to them led to new opportunities for Indians to participate in public life, as well as new debates over what form that participation should take. Indians were divided on these points, but they were moving towards something that we'd eventually think of as nationalism. We're going to dive deep into Indian nationalism next time. So until then, thanks so much for joining me. See you soon. Thank mm-hmm. you.